Okay guys, I'm back. And this week I got called out. Meta-analyses are, are kind of a study of studies. So they take, researchers take studies that have similar parameters and they kind of lump them together. And they look at, okay, what's the consensus amongst these studies? And they have advanced statistics they use to run this. If you look at low carb versus low fat, there's no difference in adherence overall on the whole. There's no difference. And there's no difference in weight loss. There's no difference in uh, blood lipids, even glycemic controls. So Lane just brings up a point where he says a meta-analysis, or he said several meta-analyses show there's no difference between low fat, low carb, uh, in adherence or weight loss or blood lipids. Uh, I beg to differ. But I want to go through and address some of the claims that uh, Ryan made. Uh, I'm going to focus on addressing those that I feel are the most relevant. The first one being that carbohydrate and fat ratios do make a difference to fat loss. Ryan said that they made a big difference to fat loss and that you see increased thermogenesis on a ketogenic diet. One of the things I said in the Joe Rogan podcast was that when you equate protein and calories, your ratio of carbohydrate to fat doesn't seem to matter. Now, Ryan made a big deal about pointing out a study from 1971 uh, where they equated uh, carbohydrate and fat and observed, I'll get to that, but I'll we'll use that term loosely, observed differences in fat loss. And uh, he said, why is, and the study happened in 1971 and nobody talks about it. And I actually, went back, I actually bought this because I did not have access to it, this, this bad boy right here. All data is just data, um, but not a sufficiently powered study to make conclusions based off of, and I'll explain why I say that. So I read through the entire thing, and uh, there are some major problems with this study. So let me just break down a little bit for you. So in the study, they did uh, a three-week baseline diet where they kind of got everybody, uh, again, kind of the baseline levels from when they start. And then they did nine weeks of dieting. And they used 1,800 calorie diets for each person, regardless of what their maintenance calories was. Uh, and the diet groups were A, 115 grams of protein, 104 grams of carbohydrate, and 103 grams of fat. B, 115 grams of protein, 60 grams of carbohydrate, 122 grams of fat, and C, 115 grams of protein, 30 grams of carbs, 135.5 grams of fat. Calorie equated, protein equated. This was the subject numbers. Two people, a whopping two people in the A diet group, a massive three people in the B diet group, and a massive three people in the C diet group. A total of eight people for three different diet groups. What I found very interesting about the study was when I started reading through it, I kept looking for the statistics. I kept looking for details about statistics. I looked for how st stats were analyzed. There were no statistics done on the data. They used words like fat loss appeared to be, appeared to be, inversely correlated with the level of carbohydrate in the diet. What? So you mean in the diet groups with two, three, and three, they saw some differences in the averages. <laughs> you will find differences in every study between the average for every group. That doesn't mean they're statistically different. In science, we use what's called a p-value to establish what we call significance. Your normal p-value needs to be less than 0.05 to be considered significant. Now, P05 is not a magic number, and there's been debates about you know, whether or not you can call something of a, a trend if it's below 0.1, this sort of stuff. But in general, this is kind of the gold standard. And you cannot call something significant in a scientific paper unless it is P less than 0.05. I actually ran the statistics in an ANOVA, which determines P-value, 
uh, based because all the data was right there in the paper. So thank you to the authors for including that. The p-value for this paper was approximately p equal to 0 0.25. Five times greater than what is required to call something significant. All this data, not significant, was not different. We're not enough subjects. Also, very interestingly, uh, in the paper they say that the nine-week diet uh, went in uninterrupted except for the week of spring break where the subjects did not have to follow the diet. They can't make this stuff up. They also didn't control physical activity. They said that it was similar between the groups, but then later they pointed out a subject who said they appeared to exercise more than everybody else. Well, funny thing, all three subjects on the lowest carb diet reported feeling more tired than the other subjects. Despite the findings of this paper, the authors actually recommended this diet. So, uh, I'm, I'm curious, Ryan, as to whether you actually read the paper to make the claims that you did. Because, just based on this alone, it is not, it is not appropriate to make claims. So, uh, again, I don't want to say that it's not data, because it is data. Data is what data is. But we cannot make any conclusions based on this. And the plethora of scientific data, including this meta-analysis of 32 controlled studies examining protein and calorie equated diets, demonstrating that in most of them, weight and fat loss is not different, but if anything, fat, restricted, fat restriction resulted in more fat loss than carb restriction. Okay, so he also cited a study um, of a metabolic ward study done by Kevin Hall. And he made a big deal about the fact that the ketogenic diet increases energy expenditure. Well, in the Kevin Hall study, they showed a small increase in energy expenditure with it, which if you read the, um, the conclusion, the authors say that the increase they detected was near the detection limits of extremely sophisticated equipment. What they didn't see was differences in fat loss. They didn't see differences in fat loss. Actually, they observed that when the subjects switched to the ketogenic diet, there was actually a slowing of fat loss. They lost more weight, but that was due to more body water loss and actually greater loss of protein and lean mass in the ketogenic diet group versus the non-ketogenic diet group. And finally, another study uh, in a metabolic ward study um, those, for those of you who don't know what metabolic ward means, it means that they took these people, housed them in a facility, fed them all of their meals, completely controlled. These people had no access to any other food other than what was provided to them. And they conducted extremely advanced measurements on fat loss, fat balance, uh, metabolic rate, all these sorts of things. In the previous study, it was done for a month. Ketogenic versus non-ketogenic, no difference in fat loss but actually a, a little bit more uh, lean body mass loss in the ketogenic diet group. And this was associated with an increase in uh, protein utilization. They also did a six day uh, analysis looking at fat balance. And what they found was that if you did a ketogenic versus non-ketogenic diet, um, you saw a big increase in fat oxidation in the ketogenic diet group. But what was really interesting is that the overall fat balance was better in the fat restricted group, in the low fat group. They had a significantly more negative fat balance, which is what you want for fat loss. And when they analyzed it, they found that fat restriction resulted in 26 grams per day greater fat loss on a per day basis. I don't want to make too much about that. Uh, I'm not saying that everybody should be following a fat restricted diet, okay? In fact, 26 grams per day of fat loss is not that big of a deal. I would argue that whatever is sustainable for you is more important. So if you prefer more fat in your diet, um, I would have more fat because something that's sustainable and something you can adhere to is far more important than trying to grab an extra 26 grams of fat per day. Because these subjects in the fat restricted group were on 17 grams of fat per day. That's not a real uh, sustainable diet for most people. 
So again, don't want to make a big deal of it. But what I do want to point out is the mechanisms. If you look at the mechanisms, studies like this, to emphasize a study like this, when we have controlled metabolic ward studies with far more participants, as well as advanced meta-analyses, to highlight a study like this, if that's what you got, it's pretty weak. He also made some claims about my, my comments on fructose. And to his credit, uh, a few studies I had not seen. So, I can't remember exactly what I said about fructose, but I probably said something to the effect of, if calories are matched uh, and you're in a calorie deficit, fructose, having some fructose probably isn't a big deal. Well, he cited a study where they gave uh, people, they had them eat their normal diet, and they had them either uh, get an additional 25% of total calories from a solution containing fructose, or 25% of total calories from a solution containing glucose. And what they found was really no differences in, in uh, fat gain, but they saw some crazy things with uh, blood lipids and uh, insulin sensitivity and some other things. Okay, but let's look at how physiological that is. 25% of your total calories from fructose. If you're talking about eating something like fruit or even something like high fructose corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup is about 55% fructose. So this would mean that you would have to get almost 45% of your entire daily calories from foods containing high fructose corn syrup. Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. But most people, and in the average American diet, they don't get near that. So I guess if you were chugging down 10 sodas a day uh, and not eating uh, very much fat or protein, you could, you could hit these numbers, but this isn't very physiological for most people. Now, does it warrant further investigation? Sure. But if we look at people who eat fruit, people who actually eat fruit, uh, all the research data says is that they're healthier and tend to live longer. So I would be shocked if you could elicit these kinds of responses from just simply eating fruit. But I'm glad that uh, Ryan brought that up because I had not seen those studies and this is how I learn and, and grow. I think it's also important to point out that Ryan has a pretty big uh, conflict of interest here. Ryan is a Prove-It specialist and Prove-It is a company that sells exogenous ketones. They are a multi-level marketing company that sells exogenous ketones. Ryan also has a book. Um, I think it's called The Ketogenic Bible. So Ryan has a very vested interest in the ketogenic diet being superior. Again, that conflict of interest, I have my own conflicts of interest, not in this realm really, because I don't promote any one particular diet. That doesn't mean that what he's saying is wrong, but I think it is very important to disclose conflicts of, inter uh, of interest when you're talking about these sorts of things. I wanted to just come up and address this. One of the things I wanna say though, just be careful how people classify themselves. You know, when I go around and people ask me, they're like, hey, what do you do? I don't go, hey, I'm a baseball player just because I played baseball and won a national championship. Similarly, people shouldn't walk around and be like, hey, I'm a, I'm a scientist or I'm a doctor just because I did one research study or I was in the lab and, and did one study at one time. I think we just need to be very careful about that. Um, just be very careful in the grand context of things because some people spout it out and like to do this measuring technique of like, hey, let me sling this around um, and try and show people who you are. Like ultimately the information will speak for itself. I will be transparent as well. The lab that Ryan came from, which is the lab of Dr. J Jacob Wilson, has been criticized by many other scientists, myself included, for finding very favorable results for companies that sponsor their research. In fact, they did a study on HMB and supplementing with HMB, free acid HMB, and ATP, where they showed and demonstrated massive increases in lean body mass in highly trained individuals. Uh, these increases in lean body mass that were seen, and I'll, I'll link the paper, these increases in lean body mass that were seen were essentially well in excess of what other studies using steroids have found. And 
a group of scientists, myself included, put out a criticism paper discussing why we have a hard time believing this. I'll be quite honest with you, myself and these scientists who criticized this paper uh, and these results believe that they're full of shit. Maybe I'm wrong, but those, those results have not been uh, validated in any other lab and um, I just quite frankly don't believe them. Now maybe I'm wrong. Maybe HMB plus ATP in supplement form is better than steroids, but I don't think so. <laughs> and I also think based on the research that the ketogenic diet is not superior for fat loss. Again, we have 32 studies equating calories and protein and we do not show that fat versus carb makes a difference. And we have several studies comparing ketogenic versus non-ketogenic calories and protein equated showing that the ketogenic diet is not superior for fat loss. That doesn't mean that the ketogenic diet is completely unuseful. That is not what I'm saying. I'm just saying it's not superior for fat loss. But if you like the ketogenic diet more and you find that it's more sustainable for you, then by all means, use a ketogenic diet, but don't tell me it's better based on a study with three, with two or three people per group that did not reach statistical significance, that was so bad that they didn't even run statistics on their own data. Give me a break. All right, guys, that's it for this week, and I'll catch you next time.